Hello, everyone. I am Jennifer Nash, Vice President of Corporate Solutions and Capacity Building at Points of Light. And we are thrilled to welcome attendees who are joining us from across the United States and globally. For those of you joining us for the first time, we welcome you. And for those of you returning, welcome back. As you are joining today, let us know where you're from in the chat feature. We'd love to know where our guests are from all over the globe. We're excited to welcome you, all of you to this incredible conversation, bringing together change makers who like us care about ending racism and are looking to listen, learn and act. At Points of Light, we believe that the most powerful force of change in our world is the individual, one who makes a positive difference. Points of Light believes that systemic racism is a threat to democracy, culture and the people impacted by the injustices and inequities it creates. It's also a barrier to civic engagement. Each of the conversations in our Listen, Learn, Act to End Racism Initiative are designed with you in mind. From input we receive from the surveys and other conversations, we know that you are seeking resources and strategies to take action on social justice. It's our hope that the conversation today builds your own knowledge and provides you with practical tools to take action in your own homes, organizations, and communities. Joining the conversation today is a diverse group of change makers from nonprofits to corporations, colleges and universities, faith based organizations, national service and individuals who are all serious about ending racism and looking for an entry point. Our approach to these conversations is with humility and we appreciate you being here today. So once again, on behalf of Points of Light and Morehouse College, welcome to our conversation on racial healing, understanding racism racial identity and how to become a racial ally. Feel free to share your thoughts and engage in the chat throughout the conversation and use the Q&A feature with specific uh, questions for Dr. Singh. Later in the conversation, we'll address those questions. I know you're all eager to get started, so let's dive in. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Doug Osborne. Doug is a health educator at uh, Southeast Alaska Regional Health Consortium in Sitka, Alaska. In meeting Doug, I've learned a lot about Sitka. Sitka is located on the Tlingit Anai. Tlingit is the name of the indigenous people that have resided in the mountainous islands that span Southeast Alaska, British Columbia, and the Yukon Territory for more than 10,000 years. And they continue to live there today. Anai is the Tlingit word for land. In 2006, Doug has uh, become a member of the Sitka Health Summit Coalition and is currently working with Sitka's decolonization discussion group that is spearheading Project 108, which is an initiative led by native and non-native locals who share a united vision of Sitka that is uh, filled with enriching relationships free from harmful effects of racism, division, and exploitive colonization. The group is committed to learning and building transformational relationships across all cultures represented in their diverse community, which includes native, American Indian, Filipino, white, black, Hispanic, and others that make up their diverse community. Project 108 is utilizing the Racial Healing Handbook by Dr. Annalise Singh to support this work. And we are delighted for Doug to share with you his community's approach to building transformational relationships across cultures addressing systemic racism and inequity. Please welcome Doug Osborne. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And thanks to Points of Light and Morehouse College for sponsoring today's event and this whole series. I really appreciated how you put the land acknowledgement in the introduction. I think that's a great way to start a meeting and it could be a really powerful contradiction uh, about uh, native erasure. So I'm zooming from my office here in Sitka, Alaska. It is on uh, Tlingit Ani and a lot of people in our town are making this movement from more of a unhealthy colonial mindset to a much healthier community mindset. And Dr. Singh's work and her wonderful book, The Racial Healing Handbook has helped us tremendously. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about our one community, one book project where we all read the same book at the same time. And the book we chose is The Racial Healing Handbook. We chose it because it's universal, it's comprehensive, it's powerful, and it takes an inside out approach and something that was said at the November Listen, Learn, Act to End Racism really illustrates why this was the best fit for us. This was Dr. Bernice King at the November webinar. She said, she was asked about systemic racism and she said, if we're gonna address it, there's some internal work that we're gonna have to do. 
And Dr. Singh is a caring counselor who provides the questions, the prompts, the encouragement, the support to help us do that internal work. So it's a great place to start. So our project started in October. We did a Zoom, a kickoff Zoom, and we promoted it in the newspaper, on the radio. We made this uh, flyer and you can see here that one of the benefits of going to the kickoff was getting a complimentary copy of the book. And the way that we did that is that we set it up with the bookstore so that people gave a verbal passcode. And the verbal passcode is a sentence we chose in the conclusion of Dr. Singh's book. And I'm gonna read that to you. This is what people had to memorize at the kickoff Zoom and then they went to the bookstore the next day to get it. So this was our verbal passcode and I think it's important. It says the system of racism didn't want you to take it on, but you did it anyways. And that's how everything about racism can truly change and how we can all begin and continue our racial healing. So 45 people went to the bookstore, they memorized that, they told the clerk that, and they got their free copy of the book. Now, thanks to some really wonderful volunteers, we were also able to do weekly book clubs. And so we had lots of choices for people, different days of the week, different times, but we also had affinity groups. And so we had a young adults group, an indigenous peoples group. We had a University of Alaska staff group. And we also had the welcome aboard group. And the welcome aboard group was for people that may be new to books like this and, and this topic. And after the program, my colleague at Sika Counseling, Missy Monjovi, she sent out a link for feedback. And I wanna read one of the things that one of the participants wrote. I think it might've been someone in that welcome aboard group. The question was, what impact did this book have on you? And they wrote, quote, I feel like the scales have been dropping from my eyes and I'm seeing systemic racism with new eyes for the first time. So we started with a kickoff Zoom. At the halfway point, we did a learning experience for chapters one through five, where we brought the different book groups together. And then the finale was in December where Dr. Singh joined us. And so she did a presentation and some question and answers. I wanted to read the first question that she got and then provide a little bit of an update. So this is a question she got at that December Q and A. It says, Dr. Singh, on page 110, you write about environmental microaggressions that send the message, you don't belong here, you won't succeed here. The example you use is a college or university with all the buildings that are named after white, heterosexual, upper-class males. Here in Sitka, our kindergartners and first graders attend Baranoff Elementary, a public school that has the same name as Alexander Baranoff, the Russian colonist and despot who in 1804 led an armed attack on local indigenous people who've been in this spot for over 10,000 years. So Dr. Singh, in your professional opinion, does the name Baranoff Elementary fit into the category of being an environmental microaggression? So Dr. Singh's answer started with yes, and then she talked about the importance of uh, being able to have a feeling of belonging in public places and the power of words. And she gave us some encouragement to continue on this path of advocating for a new name that would be more welcoming and inclusive. Well, here's the update. Last week, the Sika School District Board voted unanimously to change the name of Baranoff Elementary School. In fact, the board member who made the motion to change the name and have the Sika Tribe of Alaska come up with a recommended new name, he was one of the 91 people who participated in this racial healing handbook project. This is a powerful book and it's a great book. And then when you add the elements of the collective impact of lots of people reading it and discussing it and holding people to account and brainstorming how we can implement these ideas, bringing that element in really made it even more powerful. When you think about racism and white supremacy, these are huge societal problems that have been around for centuries. In order to address them, it's gonna take a big collective effort. That's what we tried to do with the book. And that's what you're doing today with over 1300 people on this call. So if you're interested in learning more about this, you can go to the Sika Decolonization Discussion Group website. And there's a volunteer named Kari Johnson who's really beautifully documented what happened in 2020 
to help us to decolonize and promote racial equity and take on systemic racism. She's collected over 108 stories that happened in 2020. And Dr. Singh's book, The Racial Healing Handbook, that whole one community, one book project is very well documented in that. So please uh, check that out. You can go to tinyurl.com slash Sitka Project 1 or Project 108 Sitka. So tinyurl.com slash Project 108 Sitka. So to conclude, I just want to say thanks so much for this time, for hearing the community impact story from Sitka. Thanks to all the Sitkans, a lot who are on the line who helped to make this happen. And thanks to all of you for taking the time to do this. Let's continue to listen, learn, and act in racism. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Doug, for sharing that powerful testimony. The hard work of Project 108 has done to heal the uh, community of Sitka will create a wonderful path forward. So thank you. Thank you. Next, I would like to introduce our guest presenter, Dr. Anali Singh. Dr. Singh is a professor and associate provost for faculty development uh, and a chief diversity officer at Tulane University in my hometown of New Orleans, Louisiana. Her scholarship and community organizing explores the resilience of uh, trauma and identity development experiences of queer and trans people with a focus on young people and black indigenous and people of color. Annalise is the author of the Racial Healing Handbook, Practical Activities to Help You Challenge Privilege, Confront Systemic Racism, and Engage in Collective Healing in the Queer and Trans Resilience Workbook. We are thrilled that she is joining us today for this very important and timely conversation. As a reminder, if you have specific questions for Dr. Singh, please share them in the Q&A feature. We'll address your questions later in the conversation. And while we may not be able to address each question specifically, um, share your questions in the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many as possible. And now with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Singh, to provide <laughs> some framing around racial healing and how your work began. Oh, thank you, Jen. I'm so looking for, forward to our conversation in a little bit. And yeah, I'm going to stop chatting with y'all. I uh, have enjoyed interacting with you in the chat box, and I hope you keep talking with one another. Um, thank you, Doug, for the impact story. It was so wonderful to be with Sitka. I'd love to take a lot of credit for that, but you all as a community, the truth is I've been doing that work for a long time, looking at indigenous liberation and decolonization efforts. And thank you for linking that to racism and, and, and how anti-Black racism works. Um, I want to give a special thank you to all the Points of Light team. So I want uh, to say thank you to Jen and Beth, but also to say um, thank you, my utmost gratitude to uh, the people behind the scenes who set up today. So all the Morehouse folks, but Tanisha and her team that's helping us uh, get the webinar set up today. So I'm going to go through a few slides and talk about racial healing. And then Jen and I are going to jump into a conversation and then we're going to have a good chunky uh, Q&A with you all. So um, one of the things I want to do um, as Sika and um, uh, Jen and others were talking about the importance of this is that I'm zooming from New Orleans. You know, I'm from New Orleans, as you'll hear, and uh, I had to reteach myself uh, who was on this original land. And it definitely is the Chitimacha uh, nation, along with many other indigenous nations. So I just want to give my gratitude uh, for the Chitimacha who continue to steward this land and to all indigenous and First Nations people for your stu stewardship of um, most of the land that we now call the United States of America. I usually, uh, I think over the last decade, have really uh, started a practice of really thanking and expressing gratitude uh, for why I showed up today, maybe why you showed up today. And maybe we can hear a little bit of that in the text box, in the chat box of why you um, are interested in racial healing. For me, you know, I was, uh, you know, I can't do this work every day without uh, thinking of Brianna Taylor, what would it have been like if she could have actually lived her full life? Uh, what would my life be like if she had actually uh, lived her full life? And so I also want to give a dedication not only to Brianna Taylor as we get started, um, but you know she was uh, murdered by police in March of 2020 at a time you know a couple months before George Floyd was murdered. Many of us, if we weren't in Louisville, Kentucky, we weren't even calling her name. But right after George Floyd was murdered, uh, 
you know, we also had the continual murders of black trans women. And so I do want to give a shout out and a dedication and a commitment uh, that I will continue to work to dismantle um, not only anti-black racism everywhere I can in my life. And I've got a lot to learn. I wrote a book, but I'm always learning, but also all of the intersections that make our world not uh, safe and affirming and liberatory place for black trans women. So for all of us, you know, as we go through this next uh, time we have together. I really want you to lean in this racial healing time. It's for you and it's about you. Certainly it's about us, but I think especially the last week has shown us more than ever that this is a personal endeavor. Many of our hearts break when we actually start to think about systemic racism too. So I want to give a special message to all of our black indigenous uh, people of color, Latinx, AAPI, Middle Eastern, mixed race folks, all the BIPOC folks. Um, yeah, just sending you a lot of love. Your job in this next hour-ish is to just rest, restore, heal. Uh, for white folks, um, light-skinned folks, our job is to do the work of dismantling racism. And so just wanted to give that uh, invitation that this is a conversation that white and light skinned folks really need to be in. Uh, we need to be leading these conversations. And I do need to kind of note that we aren't in a pandemic. You know, anti racism work is not new. Angela Davis is actually the first woman, as a Black woman, to coin anti racism. And we've called it a lot in the last year, not enough. Uh, but she defined anti racism as it relates to systemic uh, racism. And, you know, the way COVID 19 has unfolded, the pandemic, I think it really has demanded us to think a little more broadly and differently about what we can do when it comes to dismantling racism and specifically anti-Black racism and Indigenous erasure. So the other thing I want to invite you in as we're together today is to dream, to really imagine. We never, we're in the middle of one of the largest behavioral change that we have, changes we have seen in our lifetimes, wearing of masks. I know not everyone's wearing them, uh, but we know we should be wearing them. In, in the early stages of research on mask wearing, we knew we wore it, not for other people, but we wore them to protect other people. Now we have the research that says we wear them actually to protect ourselves. And so what, what a great kind of analogy for what we can do when we actually start to work on dismantling racism. And you know, before we get started, I also wanna call Arundhati Roy's name. At the beginning of the pandemic, she wrote an article in April of 2020. Um, and she said, you know what? The pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic is a portal. She said, we're never going back to that world that was pre-pandemic, that world before it's done. Uh, but we are in this womb space, we're in this portal time where we can actually start to think broadly about, okay, by the time the coronavirus pandemic maybe ceases, let's see if we get there, right? What have we put in place that is specific and strategic and intentional in dismantling racism that when we do that, we actually put ourselves in the portal of, of all the freedom movements that have come before us. So the other thing I would like to see in the chat box right now is I'd love to see the indigenous land that you're on uh, to just honor indigenous folks as we move uh, all throughout our webinar together. But you know, one of the first questions I asked myself when I wrote this book was, is healing from racism possible? If you look at the photo on the left side of the screen, I mean, I could have replaced that photo with what happened at the Capitol last week, right? And so sometimes we wonder, can we actually heal from this thing called racism? And my answer is I looked at research, as I looked at my clinical practice, as I looked at my own life, it was like, yes, most definitely we can heal. But it's a series of proactive individual actions and strategies we can practice throughout our lifetime. But the best news is as we begin to heal from racism, we give others the opportunity to heal from racism too. And so then I had to dig into, okay, well, what is racial healing? What would that entail? And, you know, these are not new thoughts. These are most of what I've learned is at the feet of black cisgender and trans women. Uh, but, you know, it definitely entails unlearning stereotyped racial messages that we've internalized about ourselves, whether we're white or whether we're BIPOC. You'll hear me say that acronym quite a bit, black, indigenous, people of color to center and front, uh, make sure front and center are the issues of anti-Black racism and indigenous erasure. But we also learn to recognize the wounds that uh, racism creates in us, whether we're BIPOC or white. 
And that really entails acknowledging the cost of racism. And that's right where we work. It's right where we live. It's right in our personal relationships. And then we actively work to stop participating in white supremacy. White supremacy, it's a structure that, you know, to use a non-fancy word, sucks. It was set up for a specific reason. Uh, I want to give a trigger uh, alert as I describe this for uh, Black folks in our audience. Um, but you know, the system of white supremacy is with white white folks on top. Resma Menachem, who wrote an amazing book called My Grandmother's Hands, defined white supremacy as white bodies is the supreme standard of all humanity, an absolute lie, with black bodies on the bottom absolutely a complete lie. And then that vertical system of white supremacy blowing across people of color in a horizontal way. So impacting us all, right? And so working to stop participating in that means that, you know, for BIPOC folks, we're focusing our empowerment, our rest and restoration, our unlearning of what we've internalized about race and racism. Whereas for white folks and light-skinned folks, it's stepping up to address those uh, costs. And then noticing how race drives differential privileges, and then we take action to change things. So how do we make changes in ourselves and our community? In just a brief amount of time, I'm going to go through about 10 practices that we can use, and then I'll jump into a conversation with Jim. Um, but this is why I wrote the Racial Healing Handbook as a call to action. And you'll see there are 10 racial healing practices. We'll focus on a few of them today, knowing your racial identity, relearning the history of racism, where we work and where we live, and then becoming a racial ally. But I wanted to briefly share why I got into this work. This is my mom, this is my dad. My dad was immigrated to the land we now call the United States from what was Pakistan, what was India, which is now Pakistan. Uh, the British colonized India and sliced India in half. And so he as a Sikh man, turban wearing man, along with Hindus moved from what's now Pakistan into India and Muslims were forced because of colonization to move in the other direction. My mom was born in Northeast Louisiana. And as a white woman, she knew a lot about like how to do her hair, you know, it was very important to have your hair very high like it is in this picture. Um, but she knew less, uh, was taught less on her uh, in her white lineage about the impact of systemic racism. You can imagine I grew up with this family in New Orleans. This is a picture of us in front of the very dirty Mississippi River. We didn't look like other families, um, but I think I learned as a mixed race person where my skin would darken in some seasons of the year and lighten in others. Uh, I would just notice the impact of racism that I felt, that I saw my dad experience call, being called a terrorist, being called the N-word. I grew up in the 70s. Um, it just all not only was confusing and unfair, but it just was, it was lies, right? I would hear certain things from white folks about black folks and vice versa. So as a mixed race person, my entire life, I've heard messages of people of color and white folks not talking with one another. So it's one of the reasons I wrote the book. And I'm going to fly through these strategies because I want to get to the conversation with Jen. Um, but one of the things we're going to do is we're going to go into racial identity development. It's the first practice of racial healing. And think for yourselves right now, when did you first learn that you had a race? And not just like, when did you first realize that? But how did that first realization, how does that show up in your own racial justice work today? Often when we first learned about race and racism and we were socialized into that system of who is superior and who is inferior in the system of white supremacy, we were little. Um, you know, we were learning a felt sense of superiority if we were white or light skinned and a felt sense of inferiority, even if our caregivers as BIPOC folks were telling us and teaching us about racial pride. And that's why racial healing practice number two is all about internalized racism. It's rooting that out for folks of color, not believing the lies that we've been told, but also for white folks to looking at where that internalized dominance shows up in ourselves every day. We're going to go over this strategy, relearning the history of racism in detail in our conversation with Jen, uh, but there are just four ways that we can think about reteaching ourselves the history of racism. As we saw what unfolded at the Capitol last week, if we did not have a good grounding in the history of anti-Black racism, Indigenous racial, and all the other forms of racism in the United States, what we saw would make zero sense to us. But if we started to learn that, if we continue to learn about that, it not only makes sense, but we can keep working to dismantle it. Uh, 
I did include Resma Minikim's book. I hope you go out and get it. Hopefully you've been exposed to it. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, but the fourth practice is grieving and naming racism. I know a lot of times in the work we hear white folks, don't be guilty. Yes, we don't want you to be guilty when you're working on racism, but there's grief involved. And so for white and light skinned folks, it's realizing that guilt is the glue that holds oppression in place and then moving through that into action. And again, for BIPOC folks, it's unlearning anti-Black racism in all the ways that white body supremacy lives deep within us. Racial healing practice number five is about raising our race, race consciousness. You know, when it gets overwhelming at my university or in my personal life or in my community groups I'm involved in to think about how I personally am going to end racism. I mean, how can I do that? But when I think that I can actually stop it with me, that there's some kind of I don't want to call them cookie cutter, but just very specific steps we can take. We can read, we can reflect, we can remember, but we do those things. So we take risks to end racism right where we live and work. And we know when we do that, we're going to experience rejection and we're prepared for that, right? We're ready to put something on the line. And so we continue to build our relationships. Um, in the racial healing workbook, there are a lot of prompts, you know, ways to interrupt racism. So we'll go over some of these as we talk, but those are the first five racial healing practices. And and then we get to the bottom of the racial healing wheel. And then what we hear, uh, what we uh, have on this part of the wheel are ones, racial healing practices, the first five are really about ones you do internally, uh, like knowing you have a race, reteaching yourself the history of racism. These latter five at the bottom part of the racial healing wheel are about things you do in relationship. And number six is catching yourself in the flow of racism. These are microaggressions. I love that SW shared like, is microaggressions the right word? Dr. Ibram Kende said, maybe it's microabuses. Daryl Wing Su, who did a lot of research, continues to do a lot of research on microaggressions. He's one of my mentors. But I also think we need to grow in our languages, right? And you, when you think about microaggressions and racial ones that happen over and over and over again, uh, and you see some of these uh, portrayed here, what are you? When people think it's weird that I listen to Carrie Underwood, but micro and macroaggressions can get much bigger than what's on these cards for these people, right? Um, we, I mean, those microaggressions can add up and some people have called them uh, the death of a thousand cuts. So maybe microabuses is a better word for us to use because when BIPOC folks experience these, we often question ourselves, did that really happen? What if we started believing ourselves? That's racial healing. They didn't mean any harm in saying that. Well, actually that's the part of systemic oppression that is harmful. Maybe that's why we call them abuses. We might say to ourselves, they're just curious, I guess. Well, where did we learn to like make that okay for the other person? Or we might think to ourselves as BIPOC folks, well, they're right, I don't really fit or start to question who we are, what am I really? So, you know, racial healing strategy, um, uh, this one, catching yourself in the flow of racism, is really about being prepared for those microaggressions and microabuses. How are we prepared? What's the internal dialogue we usually hear? How do we usually interrupt them or not? And then what if we were prepared? What if we knew all about racial microaggressions and abuses so that we could not only interrupt them, but we could actually create environments where they didn't exist anymore. Racial healing practice number seven is all about understanding racism and relationships, and that's in every place we are, right? No matter if it's school, work, community, friendship, dating, they're usually a top three patterns of how racism works in those settings. And so this practice is really about getting clear about what those are and then countering them. And number eight is all about, yes, we have a race, but we are queer and we're trans and we're first gen and we're veterans and we have, uh, we're young people, we're older people, we're immigrants, we're undocumented, we're US citizens. You know, there's so many other parts of who we are in terms of our race. And then we're gonna talk all about being a racial ally in a moment, that's number nine. And we're gonna talk about number 10 too, which is you know, once we do that earlier work personally and we start to interrupt racism as it's living in our relationships, then we can actually get very clear on the roles we have in the collective uh, healing of, of racism, which is collective racial healing. And so for this number 10, I always cite Nicole Hannah-Jones article, What is Owed, which was in the New York Times last summer. And I think for us, that means looking at monetary and other ways to uh, pay and engage in recordive work uh, for um, you know, uh, white enslaver activity in this country we now call the United 
United States, but also indigenous erasure. So as I kind of make this transition into the conversation with Jen, as we in, engage in this dialogue and you think about the questions you wanna ask, what if the pandemic is really a portal? And we are in this freedom movement, because we are. If last week taught us anything, <laughs> we have a choice of how we move um, in our personal and our work environments. And so I offer this quote as one uh, that inspires me on a daily basis in the work of dismantling anti-Black racism and all the other things. Um, Arundhati Roy says, on another, another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. And so with that, we are gonna jump into a dialogue. Um, and Jen, I, uh, I'm just so glad to be in conversation with you. Um, I know it has been a wild week. It has been um, a difficult time. I know we have a lot of folks um, kind of waking up at this time. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna shift it over to you for our, what, what we're calling our fireside chat. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Um, that was a lot of information in a short period of time. So hopefully we can help expand on some of the information that you shared previously. Um, but we're going to take this opportunity to talk about some of the key chapters in, in the Racial Healing Handbook. In the first chapter, Know Your Racial Identity. You say that to understand how racism works, it's important to know your own racial identity. Can you tell our audience what is racial identity and why is it important to understand what your racial identity is? Yeah, racial identity is basically how we come to know we have a race. So I identify now as a mixed race, South Asian, white adjacent person. You know, I have a white mom and Indian dad. I learned everything I knew, needed to know and, and actually didn't need to know <laughs> um, through those identities. And, but I didn't come automatically to those descriptors. And so I think racial identity is so important because if you had asked me as a child what my racial identity was, I probably wouldn't have known, but I was learning very quickly. My dad worked at Xavier University in a historically black college. And I learned very quickly as a young person that when we were in, in HBCU environment, I didn't see my dad being called a terrorist. I wasn't asked, what are you? I didn't experience racism. However, <laughs> when I was in white communities in New Orleans, that's always where it would happen, where the violence I saw my dad experience physically or the verbal violence, I saw that happen. So when I am engaging in work to dismantle racism as an adult, it's not like that little kid part of me goes away. She's still in me somewhere. And I need to learn to take care of her and really uh, understand that there's a part of me that still is scared when we're talking about racism. So I think the more we know our racial identity, the more we can trace back to those earlier messages we learned that we often as an adult say, well, we don't think that anymore. You know, I'm not scared to talk about racism anymore, but it's just not true. The way racial identity develops, um, it's way more complicated from that. So Jen, I'm curious. Um, I first learned about my race when I saw my dad called a terrorist and my dad didn't explain what that meant. And I just, you know, started asking other kids about that, right? My dad was in the middle of, as an immigrant wearing a, term, a turban, a pretty big acculturation assimilation process. So I kind of had to figure out what that meant for me, but how did you first know that you had a race? Um, it's interesting, uh, growing up in New Orleans in a predominantly black community, I don't think there was like an, an incident that occurred that I was like, oh gosh, I'm black. I think it was just sort of always known uh, because that was the community that I grew up in. But I can say that my racial identity development over the years changed, right? And I, and I feel like that was more so in elementary school. Um, I look at my friend group, in kindergarten, which was very diverse, very colorful, versus my friend group and you know, the latter years, fifth and sixth grade, right? Where it was predominantly African American. So, you know, I, I will say that I, I knew I always knew my racial identity. Uh, the fun thing about growing up in New Orleans is my, my family kind of looks like yours, right? Like <laughs> my mom, a uh, very fair complexion black woman whose family is uh, you know, African American and, and, and French, right? So my mom has a very fair complexion. My father's family is uh, predominantly African. So um, my family is the rainbow of colors, but I always knew that we were, we were black um, and, and it never became a question. Um, but I will say that just that identity and that awareness as I got older, it just became more prevalent. 
um, in environments that I was in. Um, I will say that the first time I had ever experienced racism wasn't me personally, but it was my older sister when she went away to college, went to a large predominantly white college in, um, in Texas. And that was the first time someone in my family that I knew of, um, so, you know, that I was so close to had been called the N-word. And so, and that was, that happened when I was in elementary school. And so that was my first sort of real, you know, uh, experience with racism and race uh, being an issue because I had grown up in a, in a community where, you know, I don't want to say it wasn't a thing, but I hadn't experienced it personally. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I, I mean, I heard in your story how things started to change and even through seeing what your sister experienced even later in life, things started to change, right? So I think racial identity development evolves over our lifetime, but it's definitely influenced by our most intimate relationships, the places we go to school, the places we work. And, you know, still you're at points of light. I'm at Tulane University. Our racial identity development, I think continues to be impacted where we work. And and so for our points of light community today, what I really want to encourage you to think about is not only your first experience of racism and how or, or whether you were enacting it or experiencing it or witnessing it, how did you first learn about your race, right? But how does that experience impact how you function in your work today? Um, and how, you know, what are the unhealed parts of what you learned or didn't learn? at those early points in your life, because so many times it's like we have to go back and finish the education that we never received, the resourcing and I think the healing uh, related to race, um, that maybe our caregivers and our, our teachers and uh, the play, our colleagues at work haven't been able to engage in, so. Another question I'd like to ask about uh, the first chapter is, how is racial identity different for white people than for people of color? Okay, well, this is a great question. And I want to give a shout out to one of my mentors, Dr. Janet Holmes, who really helped deepen the research on racial identity development for white people and BIPOC folks. So for white folks in our, our uh, community today, I want you to really, I'm going to go through our that white racial identity development, okay? And, and let's take what happened at the Capitol last week as an example, as we kind of go through. So, you know, one of the things that uh, racial identity development shares for both white people and BIPOC folks is that in the first stage, there's kind of obliviousness or, you know, for white folks, that first schema is called um, conformity. And that's where white folks conform to, to racism, right? Um, there's an obliviousness there, right? So um, for white folks, I know you might be, you know, have learned some things about racism at this point, but I want you to remember when you might not have known right? And where maybe you kind of just didn't ever see that racism exist. Well, if we take what happened with white folks at the Capitol uh, or white folks watching what's happening at the Capitol, we can kind of see that if someone's in that more conforming state or in the beginning of their racial identity development, they're not going to see that the group attacking the Capitol was mostly white and male, overwhelmingly. Um, and the feelings related to conformity or obliviousness, safety, contentment, satisfaction, comfort, white folks, remember when that was happening in your life. And then like the second schema, Dr. Helms used to call them stages, but now she calls them schemas because they're kind of lenses on how you view the world, right? And that second one for white folks is acceptance. So it was a more conscious rejection that racism is real. Okay, now that I see racism as a thing, but I reject it as a white person. So when BIPOC folks share their stories about it, they're like, eh, uh, la, 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 uh, you're wrong, right? Um, so I think, you know, relating to what happened just at the Capitol, I think white folks watching that and saying, okay, that's not related to racism, I reject that. You can kind of see that for white folks in that acceptance part of racial identity development, they're gonna not see that, you know, this was again, a mostly white and male group. They're just gonna, they're gonna see racism exist and acknowledge it, but it's not happening in that event. There's a lot of denial. That third part is resistance. So once white folks kind of move from obliviousness and conformity to acceptance, there's resistance. And so it's like, okay, racism is real. I see that it's real, it's happening. Maybe it's even happening to people I love. 
but it's overwhelming to think about it. And so what happens is that white folks tend to blame BIPOC folks. Well, why does that happen? Because we don't have adequate history in our textbooks. We don't have caregivers who are raising us with the information we need about white supremacy. And so what happens is that white folks in resistance so say, well, it's not really racism, we just need to learn to get along. So again, if we think at the Capitol, what happened at the Capitol, folks, white folks in resistance may be like, well, yes, people were just upset about the election, right? Then, you know, if folks keep progressing on their uh, white racial identity development, there's a, a, a schema called retreat. And that is a space where white folks, you know, they start to realize like, okay, racism is not only thing, I can't deny it. I can't bargain in any way anymore. I see it happening to people I care about, um, but I'm still overwhelmed, right? And so in, in this stage, it's almost like a incubator time where white folks start to teach themselves more about racism and the role of white supremacy in it. And then there's that emergence uh, schema for white folks where white folks then start to say, okay, I, I retreated a little bit to learn and now I'm starting to move out, back out into relationship with BIPOC folks folks and searching out for other white anti-racists who are ready to gear into action. So for white folks, you know, think about, you know, where were you last week when you saw what happened at the Capitol? <laughs> and maybe you're an emergence, okay? That's easy place to say we are. But where might have you gone a little bit into retreat? You know, you know, just kind of challenge yourself about that. Integrative awareness, it's the kind of final uh, schema for white folks. And it's where, you know, white folks are exploring anti-racism, but they also see that, hey, they're black trans women, they're white veterans living with disabilities. They see that there are other identities related to uh, race. For BIPOC folks in terms of their racial identity development, it's different. Uh, the beginning and the end points are similar, you know, so for BIPOC folks, we're born into a world where maybe we're ascribing to white norms, values, behaviors without question, even if we have BIPOC parents or, or white care givers who are teaching us pride, right? Until, as you talked about, Jen, you know, someone experiences that first instance of racism, as BIPOC folks, we might be oblivious. And so for BIPOC folks watching what happened at the Capitol last week who were in conformity, they might have been not even thinking about racism, the role racism had in that attack, right? Then BIPOC folks have uh, moved into what's called dissonance. And that schema or that lens on the world is like, whoa, I just experienced racism. We question ourselves. We wonder if that really happened. Was that directed me? Why, wait, why did they treat me that way? And we become suspicious of the motivations of white people as we should. Immersion uh, is that next uh, schema that BIPOC folks move into where we notice more and more of the racism that we experience and other BIPOC people experience. We start to feel anger towards white people. I call this the boundary stage. We have woken up that racism impacts our lives. We have been surprised and caught off guard and we are not gonna be caught off guard again. You know, James Baldwin said, you know, um, Black people know more about white people than white people know about themselves. Why? Because they've had to pay attention more. And after that immersion stage with an I, you know, BIPOC folks move into immersion with an E, where once we move out of toxic white communities where our stories aren't believed, we then move into connection with our own BIPOC community where we don't have to explain things. We can actually receive nurturance and a sense of belonging, right? So white folks just think about, you know, you have your own racial identity development, but as I describing BIPOC racial identity development, you can kind of see when BIPOC folks move out of relationship, it's not because we're mad. Well, sometimes we are. Anger is a sign of boundaries, but we are moving into restoration of ourselves in connection with our communities. And yes, Dr. Janet Helms is the author of these uh, racial identity development models. And then internalization is kind of a, a later schema, whereas BIPOC folks, once we are immersed in our own community, we don't have to explain our experiences of racism or when we share them, we're believed then we can move into internalization where we can start to see that white anti-racist people exist and that, you know, again, they're BIPOC trans people, they're BIPOC veterans, people have different intersections of identities. So I think in terms of, it's really important not just to know our own racial identity, but 
to also know how our racial identities show up at work, you know, in our organizations, our nonprofits, our universities, um, wherever we work. Um, so we can be better and better and more quickly identify where as a white person, you might be numbing to a BIPOC person's pain or as a BIPOC person where something just happened nationally and you actually need to move into comfort. And so um, I know that was a longer answer, but I think it's one of the key, it's like the foundation, it's number one for me of our racial healing practice. Absolutely, absolutely. We got a question, I know I'm going out of order. But yeah, let's do it. Appropriate here, we got a question from Christina and her question is, uh, what does white adjacent mean? Yes, thank you for asking that, Christina. So I think in my life, you know, um, I just have learned that for me as a non-Black person of color, for me was someone with white heritage. And I think this is for everyone, um, whether you're BIPOC, you know, just with lighter skin, is that often um, we are adjacent to white privilege, right? So especially now uh, as an adult, you know, my partner is white. My dad passed in my mid twenties, you know, so I work in a historically white university. I I'm very adjacent to whiteness a lot of the times, which I means I'm adjacent to that power. So, um, I, I don't say I have white pr privilege as a mixed race person with white heritage because it really depends. You know, I kind of describe myself as a racial Rorschach and depending on whether people project white or person of color onto me, depends on whether I am able to access that power and privilege. So um, for dark skin BIPOC folks, sometimes uh, you might have uh, white adjacent privilege too, right? So, um, or access to white adjacentness, I should say. You might've been raised uh, by white caregivers, you know, or you might have a predominance of white friends. And so uh, that white adjacentness for me connects me to the ongoing work of anti-Black racism, um, and also knowing that light skin privilege is a very real thing in the racial hierarchy of white supremacy. So thank you, Christina. And thanks for pausing there, Jen. No problem. Um, I'd like to move on to uh, the chapter about relearning the history of racism. Um, growing up, a lot of what people learn about race and racism is inaccurate or it's incomplete. Um, what steps can we all take to relearn the history of racism? Okay, so <laughs> I'm not going to ask y'all this pop quiz question, but I, I am going to ask this. I'm a professor, right? <laughs> uh, in the chat box, where did racism start? <laughs> Who can give me that answer? Um, I know that Jen and I both grew up in Louisiana. <laughs> and uh, we both took a class in Louisiana history that was woefully inaccurate in many ways. But so often we don't learn where racism started. And you, you know, please read Dr. Abram Kende's uh, work on this because, uh, yeah, I'm getting a lot of great answers in the chat box, but we want to be very specific. Isn't it interesting? Like, how can we heal from racism and engage in racial healing? if we can't name how we got here in the origins. So I'm gonna bring y'all back to Prince Henry in Portugal. And I'm going to bring you back to the history of enslavement. And I see someone quoted uh, or referred folks to Tim Wise. He and I went to Tulane together and graduated together. He's, he's one of my favorite people. So we, and we can go way back, but in the history of humanity, humans have kind of sucked. We always have had some way that we've uh, created enslavement, you know, where someone was uh, the enslaver and someone was forced into slavery. That was not always connected to skin color. But Prince Henry in Portugal was like, hmm, I notice that when the people I'm enslaving, the humans I'm enslaving who have darker skin, when they try to escape, which for all people who've ever been enslaved, even in sex trafficking and other forms of slavery that happened today in 2021, people escape, people fight back. And so when people with darker skin would escape, he was like, hmm, I'm making less money. And so then you have the tying of uh, enslavement to anti-Black racism and then a system that then justifies and has to justify dark skin and black people as the bottom of that racial hierarchy to justify that making of money. Go reteach yourself. You know, there are so many different ways 
that we have got to get it right. And so many of you added different pieces of this puzzle, but when we are asked that question, how did racism start? We want to have an answer. Right. <laughs> and so um, there's so much more I could say, Jen, but um, I think that is, um, you know, we have very seriously got to look at anti-Black racism in this country. And so I'm, I'm going to constantly be calling that story. Fantastic. I, and I don't know if you have a, um, a resource that you'd like us to share in the, in the chat that can... So yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Ibram Kende's book, Stamped from the Beginning, is the primer. It's this thick, <laughs> uh, but it's worth reading. Um, and, you know, then definitely read Isabel Wilkerson's The Warmth of Other Sons. Um, it's a different part of the story of anti Black racism. But, um, and then there was a remix of Dr. Kende's book with Jason Reynolds uh, for young folks and, you know, for adult folks who are over 18 who don't have, maybe you don't want to read that thick book, read, read the remix with Jason. It's wonderful too. Let's, let's move on to allyship, um, which is the focus of the ninth chapter in the Racial Healing Handbook. Um, during registration, we asked how equipped attendees felt to take action as a racial ally and find that every, we found that everyone is coming to allyship with different levels of readiness and concern about making a mistake, but all eager to learn more. What does it mean to be a, a racial ally and are there rules to allyship? Oof, that's such a good question. I mean, I think that, you know, racial ally, that word in the last year, especially since the murder of George Floyd by the police has been, it's almost become a little bit of a dirty word. And I want to like bring back racial allyship for uh, many reasons. Like, I think we need to have some good, solid racial ally behaviors before we get into what has often been called in community organizing settings is co-conspiratorship and accompliceship. So I think the first thing to realize about racial ally is that we can all do it. For white folks and light-skinned folks, this involves interruption. This involves sponsorship. You know, this involves, for instance, I'm in a university right now. And so there is an absence of black wealth in the university. There's the absence of a lot of BIPOC wealth in the university. And so that is one way I can be an ally is building access, building, um, you know, faculty and staff uh, pipelines, right? Mm -hmm. um, but for BIPOC folks, we, also can be racial allies. Sometimes we're experiencing so much racism that we forget that we have power and that we have power and in numbers. And so, you know, I just, one of my teachers and I miss him so much was representative John Lewis. I spent a couple decades in Atlanta learning from him. And, you know, as a beloved teacher, when he showed up and taught us, I mean, he would call good trouble all the time. And so I think being a racial ally means we're getting into that good trouble. We're making that good trouble representative John Lewis talked about. Um, but we also know that it's a journey. And the reason I want to, us to reclaim racial ally and allyship, um, I want us to critique the heck out of it. Um, but we, we need to know the research on it. The research on allyship in general says we often ally to someone because of our self-interest. So for every white and BIPOC person on this call, I want you to think about the first time that you were being a racial ally or standing up for someone you cared about right? Maybe it was a, a, a friend, a colleague, a family member. But then as we stand up for that one person, then we can move into that identity development as an ally of being altruistic. We're doing it for the greater good. You know, maybe we're becoming a racial ally because what happened at the Capitol should never happen again. But again, that's for this bigger group. So we went from, we're doing it from one person to we're doing it for the world, but the later spaces of, of racial ally development is all about social justice, where white folks, light-skinned folks are doing this work as a racial ally because it's about their own liberation. And BIPOC folks, we do racial allyship because it's about our own liberation. And I don't think there are rules about doing allyship. I mean, it is about action. It's not a passive thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think about some guidelines and guidelines are, you know, staying humble, you know, <laughs> and don't get out there and be like, I'm a racial ally. Right, exactly. People exactly. like hundred percent be like, no, you're not. Yeah, and I think, I think we're seeing, <laughs> we're seeing a lot right now where we're seeing a lot of, uh, you know, post what I call the killing summer we had last summer, which was not a new summer, uh, killing summer. It was just, 
another version of, you know, killing BIPOC folks summer, um, a lot of um, people went back into their work settings and a lot of white people were um, telling BIPOC folks what, what and how they should be feeling mm -hmm. about racism. So don't do that. And then apologize when we get it wrong, you know, and don't make it a drawn out apology, right? Apologize quickly, make reparations and move on. And then educate and revamp. We need to be a good listener. And I think this is very important. One of the one of the things we can all do, if we care about what happened at the Capitol last week, if we care about what happened last summer, if we care about making sure BIPOC folks live and thrive in 2021 at higher rates than ever before, then we have got to believe and listen and follow the leadership of BIPOC folks. They, I trust you, there are BIPOC folks who are bringing things up in your setting right now that are not being heard. We can go back into our work and personal settings and hear them and believe them. We can continue to educate ourselves about racism and connect with other racial allies, but the don'ts, you know, the general guidelines are, you know, we don't appoint ourselves and we don't pause our racial allyship. So for me, I have a practice in the morning and in the evening, you know, my morning practice is really about, you know, how is internalized, I'm going to be on guard and curious about how internalized whiteness shows up in me today. And at the end of the evening, before I go to bed, I ask myself, I do an inventory of how did internalized whiteness show up in me as a non-Black person of color doing work on racism? I think the other uh, thing we may want to avoid, uh, in addition to not pausing our racial allyship, building those structures that we have every day, is you know, participating in call-out culture. We want call-in culture. We want to call ourselves in. And of course, we don't want to talk about being a racial ally every chance we get. We're probably in a certain part of racial identity development if we're doing that. And we can't have all the answers to solving racism and we can't and should not avoid the feelings of grief and loss. I think for white folks and light-skinned folks, the crying, the guilt, the shame, it's best to process that with other white and light-skinned folks, but don't stuff it and don't judge each other for it. We are grieving. We have lost so much of our humanity in this process. And so if we're really to move from a solid racial ally to putting more stuff on the line, which means we are moving to that accomplice and co-conspirator, um, you know, as a white or BIPOC folk person where we're taking risk, then we, you know, we do want to follow those general guidelines and get lots and lots of feedback. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm uh, looking at the, the chat and the Q&A light up. Yeah. So I'm going to move <laughs> to the Q&A section. And we appreciate everyone that submitted a question for Dr. Singh during registration and online. Um, but before we dive into questions, um, I just wanted to say that um, there is power and responsibility to civic engagement. And I believe that is something that all of us here feel. And the violence and unrest that occurred at the United States Capitol represented a clear and dangerous break from our constitutional right to and tradition of peaceful protest. It was wrong and it brought about a range of emotions. Um, and so we did get some questions uh, based on the events that happened last week. And I feel like it is uh, appropriate for us to ask questions at this time. So the first question, Dr. Singh comes from Brooklyn, New York. And that uh, guests asked, how do we depolarize our country and bridge the gaps that the Trump presidency has exacerbated tenfold? Whew, this is a big question, and I'm so glad uh, for you and everyone at Points of Light and everyone in this community. I mean, the first thing we have to do is speak out and hold our leaders accountable within our work and other uh, professional, personal settings. You know, we need to have those conversations with our supervisors, with our colleagues, with our family members, but we also need to not skip over doing the work locally. We know what happened. We know exactly what happened. We know the roots of that and what happened really started um, after the Civil Rights Act was passed. That in that, <laughs> that kind of anti-Black, anti-BIPOC hatred and uh, movement was rooted in everything that drove the Civil War and you know even Reconstruction and the dismantling of that. So I think I know that 
I know it feels like a big thing, but I promise you get to work in your local communities. I work in higher ed where we have lots of racial inequities. We are really good at replicating societal inequities. So the strategic planning work that we do in our organizations, your spiritual community, your neighborhood, all of that work adds up over time. Representative John Lewis would always tell us in Atlanta, don't stop, keep going, stay focused. We know what happened. We need to call it what it is. And we know the resistance is there. And when the resistance is there, you know, Representative Lewis would always tell us that that meant our work was having an impact. I think we've also got to tell the truth. This is what our country looks like in 2021. It's depressing as heck. We can be aghast for days and weeks and we have a hard week to come and maybe a hard week ahead. But we know for every game Black Americans, for instance, make that there has been a coordinated setback in history. And so what we're looking at is how have the liberation and freedom fighters move forward? And again, that brings me back to racial allyship. We have got to follow the leadership of BIPOC folks. When we speak and listen, uh, we are listened to and believed. Um, and I think, um, we've got to keep imagining a world without racism. We've got to take that ability back and come out of crisis and reactivity mode. That is where white supremacy wants us. It wants us draining all our energy in reactivity as opposed to getting down deep at and rooting out and upending where the anti-black racism lives in our organization and where all the other types of racism lives. So, I mean, we could talk about that for days. Uh, but I really encourage folks, have the feelings, have the anger, have the boundaries. BIPOC folks, I want us restoring, taking time, resting. And white folks and light-skinned folks, it's time to get to work. This is a problem that was not created by BIPOC folks. Racism <laughs> was not created by BIPOC folks. We're not the ones to dismantle it. Thank you. I mean, we can, it's not our responsibility, <laughs> I should say. There you go. Uh, Steven asked, uh, how can we come together and bring people on board to anti-racism ideals? And how do we reach out to people who are so vehemently against the work that we're doing? Yeah, I think one of the, you know, this is why I wrote the racial healing handbook. We've got to start with the basics, you know, uh, the freedom fighters of civil rights, of the Black Lives Matter movement, of, you know, the Latinx and AAPI and Middle Eastern and indigenous freedom movements. They've always done the same thing. They've started with recognizing that racism exists and go back to racial healing practice number one, because it's not our job to make people move ahead in their racial identity development. But for instance, if the white folks in your organization are in conformity, obliviousness that it exists, or in that resistance or acceptance stage schema, you saying that, hey, we've got to do anti-Black racism, that's probably not the, la the first step. The first step is interventions with um, education, uh, with language, uh, with boundaries while you're also doing the good policy work. So I think um, one, one thing I often see in our, our groups is that we often talk about, it's usually one white guy that is against the work and then we don't move forward. White folks and light-skinned folks have conversation with that one white guy. We do not have a BIPOC problem when it comes to systemic racism. We have a white and a light skin problem when it comes to racism. So I think the first step is uh, white and light skin folks calling people in, not using interventions that are at that latter, more internalization, uh, integrative awareness schema, and starting right back in questions with how did you learn you had a race? using data. I mean, you know, why do we care about anti-Black racism, whether you're talking about gender, sexual orientation, veteran status, age, religion, Black folks have the least amount of access along with Indigenous folks. And then you have other folks, groups of color who have also less access than white folks. So um, again, John Lewis said, keep going, do it, start the interventions and, um, and work with the white and light skinned folks where you are. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, we got a question from John. He said, uh, you have mentioned the importance of caregivers several times. Can you give some examples of appropriate guidance and teaching and caregiving to, being yeah. a, uh, to bring racial awareness at a younger age? Uh, is there a resource targeted for caregivers in daycare settings? 
Yes, I love that question. Who was that? Uh, that was John. Hey, thanks, John. Okay, so again, you know, Ibram Kendi, he's one of my uh, heroes. I think, you know, um, Anti-Racist Baby is a great one, uh, but I think this book is anti-racist, is also great for uh, young people. Um, and I think that in terms of uh, the best way to start with those kind of communities is um, leaning into the fear that I think there's often, especially for white and light-skinned folks, there's often this uh, space where people will um, say, well, we don't want to talk about racism because they're too young. Well, that's exactly where people are actually learning about racism and their different roles in racism. So there's not too young of an age. Racial identity development starts very early. And so I think talking about it openly with people, uh, um, but starting with the caregivers first <laughs> so that they're resourced in these conversations is helpful. Kim is asking, um, can you please explain call-in culture? Yeah, call in culture. Actually, Adrian Murray Brown just had a great book come, come out about um, call in culture. Um, I think, you know, call out culture is when folks get on social media and we blast each other. It zero changes anything. We can get on Instagram, we can get on Twitter, it's easy. I'm not saying we shouldn't hold people accountable, we should. But I think what I'm noticing more and more um, after the killing summer of last, of last year is that often people are moving only to holding people at the top accountable, are only holding people accountable on social media and skipping over that local work. And so I think that um, Oof, you, we've got to start locally where we are. And so calling culture is when we disagree with our leaders when we write an email, you know, ask for a meeting. I know it may be scary or you may not have the energy. And if you're BIPOC, maybe you're not the one to do it. Maybe you need to pass it off to your white or light-skinned colleague, right? Um, but I think having these conversations intentionally is so much more important in terms of setting up the stage to make change as opposed to just calling things out all the time. There is a time and a place for calling out. I'm not saying we should never do that. Mm -hmm. But I think if we really want to change things in our local settings, we've got to have the conversations with one another. And BIPOC stands for Black Indigenous People of Color. And that acronym surely is really to center the work of anti-Black racism and countering Indigenous erasure. Uh, a comment slash question. Um, I've also noticed in conversations that some people are coming into it saying white people are evil or white people's voices aren't wanted or needed in these conversations. Um, despite feeling empathy for those feelings, I think it's largely counterproductive to any real progress. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, let's not get distracted. I think this goes back to something Janae Franklin said in the chat box that I, and I do agree with you, Janae, like that is a part of BIPOC racial identity development where, you know, we're conforming uh, and saying racism doesn't exist. And, you know, we can do as much harm. Well, I don't want to say as much harm because we don't hold as much power as white folks, but we can definitely internalize racism and enact it. Toni Morrison famously said, not on my skin folk or my kinfolk, right? And she was talking about, you know, um, um, communities of color that were specifically Black people where there was heavy internalized racism. Um, but I think that there's a difference between making people evil and then making, holding people accountable. It just is true that BIPOC folks did not create the system of racism, period. Mic drop. So what does that mean? That means that white folks and light-skinned folks have to lead this work. I mean, the higher you go in most organizations, the more white and the more masculine it gets. And that's typically where power is held. So um, are those folks evil? <laughs> uh, I don't think that's helpful to say that, but do I think those folks are responsible? 100%. We know that the policies, procedures, practices, the decision makers that are often working in rooms where there aren't BIPOC folks present 
you know, those are the policies that are driving a lot of the inequities we have. Now, I did see a study recently, interestingly, about white men, and I want to bring that up. And it was a study, it's actually been studied over a couple of decades now, where, um, you know, they were looking at kind of, you know, the aversive effect of different things like climate change, you know, uh, you know, big culture, big cultural uh like big oppressions, like bad stuff in the world. And what they found is that the group that had the least amount of urgency to these issues was white men. Okay, well, you're talking about ending racism, you're talking about ending sexism, you're talking about ending heterosexism, you're talking about the environment and other sexual harassment. Okay, you've got mostly white men, you know, holding power in a lot of organizations, not all. So if those folks are actually more numb <laughs> to the urgency of those things, we got a problem. We don't have to say white men are evil, but often in my work, I, you know, I will notice, okay, we've got a white guy issue. You know, white men need to call each other in uh, to do the work together. And we know in our communities, uh, I'm not saying white men are absent, um, but we know in our communities when we do these initiatives, we often don't have huge numbers of white men. Why is that? I wonder if it is because of the system of white supremacy that, you know, there is a numbing to the urgency of, of many of these really important issues. So white, white men here, I want to call you in and, you know, for the white women and the BIPOC men, women, and all the trans folks uh, included, you know, as you go back to your work settings, you know, think about how you can uh, call white men, white communities, light skin communities in to do this work. And avoid the evil stuff. Don't get distracted there. Let's not be aghast about that. If someone says someone's evil, it's okay. <laughs> it's been 500 years of horrible, horrible anti-Black racism and other forms of racism. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Singh, we can go on for several more hours. <laughs> um, and while we weren't able to address every question being asked, um, I hope that we've been able to provide some deeper insights and knowledge. And as we prepare to close, uh, we would appreciate your final thoughts and recommendations for homework for our audience. Sure, thank you, Jen. Well, I've loved being in conversation with you and I just so appreciate all the work you do. And thanks to the Points of Light community for being here. Um, it has just been an honor. I've thought the world of you all for a long time. So it's great to be with you and work with you. I think three things. One, we've got to seek the truth about racism. We've got to take, two, we've got to take action on systemic racism locally. And three, we've got to engage in everyday reparative work with racism. For number one, speaking the truth, learn the history of how systemic racism, specifically anti-Black racism and indigenous erasure, impacted the land where you live, the workplace or school you attend, and the history of your country. Once we have that knowledge and we can name that, we can start to heal. Two, once we take action on systemic racism and locally, this means sharing our developing knowledge about that systemic racism and, and sparking crucial conversations about dismantling racism right where we live and work. And cultivating humility as we do that, developing accountability groups and strategic plans to address those racial inequities with clear outcomes delineated. Dr. Kende said, anytime racial inequities exist, that's where systemic racism is. So we're centering these actions all the time of addressing racial inequities. That number three is engage in everyday reparative work with racism. Let's not leave this out. Um, the dismantling of racism where we live and work is tied to reparations. It's tied to our relationships with BIPOC folks. It's, you know, there are real and persistent resource gaps and accessibility barriers um, for BIPOC people that is a result of intergenerational racism. I think reparations can and should come in the form of money and resources and should also show up in our everyday actions and believing BIPOC folks when they share about what they need. And also for us serving as sponsors, not saviors uh, for BIPOC folks by removing those barriers and increasing access within our organizations and communities. So I can't wait to see what the Points of Light community does uh, as a result of these listen, learn, and act in racism conversations. And I just greatly thank you all for being here today. Well, thank you, Dr. Singh, for sharing your insights and wisdom with us today. And um, we also want to thank Doug Osborne for sharing his story and wish the community of Sitka well as they continue their work. Um, I want to give our audience a very special thank you for tuning in today and our uh, friends at Target and Comcast for supporting Listen, Learn, Act, and Racism and to help us take action 
our speakers and the team at Points of Light have uh, developed a list of resources, including worksheets to support the homework Dr. Singh just shared. Um, you can find the homework resources uh, on the Listen, Learn, Act to End Racism page on our website at pointsoflight.org. And you'll also receive an email following this conversation with a link. Um, you'll also re receive a link to the recording of this conversation, which will be posted soon. And also just wanted to share with you that our next conversation hosted by Morehouse College will be on how to show up as leaders, preparing the next generation of social justice champions. And that will be on Thursday, February 25th. So we hope to see you then, but thank you all again. And this concludes our time together today. Be well, everyone.